welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's back. What's up? Oh, you're going to come in with a sup. Sup. Coming in hard, huh? Just trying to talk like the cool kids. Oh, how's that going for you? Not so great. But you know what? I, you know what I do want to say is when you talk to kids and you talk to your clients, I think that the thing that people like about you is your relatability. You don't use these big words where you have to look them up or well, Google those them. are hard, you know. And but a you lot speak. Of syllables. You speak like the the average guy. Thank you. Well, I am an average guy, I, and that's what I love about you. And I love the fact that you'll do this every week with me. Um, you know, it, we record this podcast on a Thursday. Yep. It drops on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So when this podcast drops today, which would be Tuesday, because you're listening, if that makes sense. Yeah. I've been celebrating my five year anniversary of sobriety. All right. Woo. Five years, man. What, what's the date? Uh, September 3rd. September 3rd, coming up this weekend yep. or last weekend, depending yeah. on how you think about it. Yeah. And so it's crazy. And I get a lot of people asking me, is it tough? Is it hard? And and, and the simple answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, it is tough, but it's not as hard as I thought it was going to be. It's because of your attitude. I don't know if that is, but no, I know he- that is true. Here's the thing. I have been tested recently. Have you? And I'm going to go over some, some of the tests. for the, the low T? No, 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 because oh. I'm, I'm, my, my T's high. We're talking about my testosterone. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you had that fixed. It is fixed. Okay, good. And it's good. Yeah. Um, but I've had some tests, uh, my sobriety and my mental health recently, and they weren't fun ones. Oh. Uh, recently just lost a friend um, who was in recovery. I didn't know he was, but when I got sober, he came up to me, and this guy had like 30 years of sobriety underneath his belt. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, lost his battle to cancer. Oh, I'm sorry uh, to hear that. His name was Kelly Wheat, and he was an amazing guy. So much in the fact that, I mean, I knew of him and he knew of me, but when I got sober, uh, he would text me um, every day on my birthday, on my sobriety birthday. Oh. And it's sad because I won't get that text this year. Yeah. Because he passed, and uh, it broke my heart, and it broke my dad's heart, and it was really tough. And it was one of those things that uh, make you just question, you know, everything and i know i'm doing the right thing because um it just feels right and everything's going well so that was a pretty big test the second thing was um i dj'd an elementary school back to school night i did see the pictures on that and um if you've ever wanted your sobriety test i suggest doing that job uh it's (laughs) it's a little crazy you need Uh, a sedative afterwards i'm gonna tell you this um 20-something drunks are about the same as fourth and fifth graders. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. The, they're obnoxious. Yep. Uh, Loud. They're relentless. Yep. <laughs> Lots of crazy energy. Persistent. Yep. <laughs> you know, and so, I mean, I had a blast doing it. I really did. But I was like, holy cow, man, this is a lot coming at me hard. <laughs> you know what I mean? All these young kids. And yeah, uh, it, it, it was a test. And, and I joke with that one because I really had a good time. But this one is was tough, man. Um, well, talk about how it, uh, like you say, it's a test of your sobriety. And first of all, I mean, I think all of us, uh, most everyone's lost someone to cancer, and we we feel empathy for you. That's really hard to lose somebody who is such a good support and a good friend, and obviously a friend of the family. Um, in what way do you think that tested your sobriety? Well, that one, and then this one I'm going to tell you about right now, tested them because I just wanted to escape. Mm -hmm. I just wanted the pain to stop, even if it was just temporary. So here's what happened two nights ago. And I've been known, and this has been coming for a long time. Um, My dog, English Bulldog Steve. Oh. he's, uh, He's my ride or die. He's been with me through thick and thin. Yeah. Some of you guys have heard the story about when I went to rehab, I had three dogs. Uh, My mom took one, my dad took one, and my aunt took Steve, an English bulldog. When I got out of rehab, uh, I called my mom and I was like, can I get Daisy? And she's like, well, Daisy's really found a home here and she's best friends with Swiffer and do you think I could just keep her? And I was like, how do I say no to my mom? You know, she just put me in rehab and yeah. she's been taking care of everything. Yeah, mom. Yeah, you can have Daisy. And I call my dad. He's got Lily. And I go, hey, dad, can I get my dog? You mean Lily? My dog? And I was like, oh. <laughs> dad he, was attached. He huh? was like, this dog has saved me. 
you know, it gives me a purpose and uh, oh, it means good. everything to me. So what do you think the chances I could just keep Lily? I was like, well, same, same answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pretty good, dad. Lily's your dog now. Two minutes later, the phone rings. It's my aunt Karen. Hey, when are you going to come get this effing dog? <laughs> <laughs> Steve, yeah. I'm done. I go, you know, Aunt Karen, I don't have a license. I'll bring him to you. Well, you have Daisy <laughs> and you have Lily. Really sweet names. Yeah. And then you got Steve. Yeah, the English bulldog. <laughs> yeah. And I guess Steve had ate her dentures and she followed Steve around for a week hoping he'd poop him out. Oh, no, no, uh, no. New dentures. Though. Come to find yeah. a month later, she had hit him and forgot she hit him from Steve. Oh, <laughs> she found Steve him. Steve got blamed for it. Yeah, Steve got blamed for it. But Steve was my ride or die. And so when I got back from rehab, uh, it was just me in an empty house and Steve. Yeah. And uh, he was my dog. And I knew he was sick and he was having some hip problems. And I'd been trying to get him to the, the vet. And, you know, they just said, hey, Steve's 12. Most English bulldogs live 8 to 10. Oh. So he hung in there. And uh, I've been dreading it. And if you're a if you're a pet owner and you have that option of either putting your dog down or letting them pass on their own, it's a tough one. It's really hard. And most of the time, I think as a pet owner, we hope they'll pass on their own so we don't have to make that tough decision. Mm-hmm. Are we ending their life too short? You know, because we, we really don't know, you right. know. And, and dog's mentality, the pack mentality, is not to show any um, – ailment because if they do they get left and whatever so they always put their best foot forward dogs do they They all you know what they do and so i had to make this decision and i didn't want to do it and i realized i was being selfish because i didn't want to make the tough decision and i i didn't want to be without him Mm -hmm. but then i had to ask myself what kind of quality life was he having yeah and you know what would be better for steve and that's, and that's the ultimate question that I had to answer. What would be better for Steve? Not what would be better for me. What would be better for Steve? That's a hard one because you can't ask Steve. No. Nope. Steve's going to act like he's fine if he can. You know. But it's hard. If he, It sounds like he was, he was a pretty old gentleman there. Yeah. And he was a good dog to the very, very end. And so uh, I let the kids say goodbye and uh, I loaded him up in the car and uh, we go through the... Uh, the drive up at McDonald's. And I go, I'd like two double quarter pounders. Steve. And uh, they go, okay. And I haven't had a double quarter pounder from McDonald's in probably 10 years. Mm-hmm. But I knew Steve would love it. Yep. And so I, so I picked him up. And oh, we, you're breaking my heart, man. And so we go, uh. this, 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 you're not going to believe how this story ends. And so uh, we go to the vets. And uh, Steve's in the back. And I'll go in and I go to the vet. And I go, hey. Do you think I got time to have a hamburger with my dog? And he's like, sure. There's some grass patch out on the back. Why don't you go back out there and sit down and say goodbye to Steve and have your hamburger and then come in when you're ready. So I go, okay. So me and Steve go back. We sit on the grass and I open up the McDonald's bag and uh, I feed him his double cheeseburger and uh, I eat my double cheeseburger. And we just, you know, we have this special moment and it was cool. And, uh, and it was, I knew it was ready, and I, and I knew the time was. So I go back into the vet, and I go, I think I'm ready. And he goes, okay. So we go out on the grass, and I got Steve on my lap. And uh, the vet comes out and sedates him. And uh, he's in my arms, and they sedate him. And he goes, it's going to take about five, ten minutes for him to fall asleep. And then when he does, we'll come down and we'll administer the shot. Mm. And I go, Okay. So he puts it in there, and then me and Steve just sit on the grass. Beautiful summer day, and uh, I can hear him starting to fall asleep. And he falls asleep. And uh, he's on my lap, so I don't want to get up and tell the vet that he's asleep. So I figure I'll just sit here. And then when the vet's ready, he'll come out. So me and Steve end up laying on the grass. He's in front of me. I'm behind him. And this lady walks by, and she goes, no. Oh. Is your dog okay? And I go, no, it's he's not. He's we're putting him down. She goes, that's sad. I'm sorry. She goes, my son's in the car. He's autistic. Would you be okay if he comes and sees your dog? Gosh, man. And I go, um, he's sedated, but sure, no, that would be great. 
So she goes and gets him, and he comes out, and uh, it was one of the most sweetest moments I've ever been witness to, because he leans down, and then he's talking to Steve, and he's saying like five different names, and he goes, these will be all your new friends at Rainbow Bridge. Say hi to him for me. Wow. And he kisses Steve. And he gets up and I go, thank you. And he introduces himself as, and he goes, you know, my name is Greg. And I go, I'm Casey. And the lady goes, I thought that was you. She goes, you're the guy from TV, aren't you? And I go, yeah. So this is really sweet um, with your dog, Steve. Uh, she goes, do you mind if I get a picture? I don't think anyone's going to believe I ran into you. Oh and I go, um, yeah, no, no, that, not, not a problem. And so I stand above Steve, me and Greg, and I go, uh, do you mind if I keep my sunglasses on? I've been crying. And she goes, no, that's cool. Wow. And oh, so, my God. So, 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 if, so she takes a picture. If I didn't know your life, I would think you're making this all Swear up. Swear to God, right hand to God, takes a picture. And, you know, at first I was like, I don't know what to think. But then I was like, you know what? This is my life. And this is yeah. Steve. And, and, and he would find this funny. And, and, and it was and it was a sweet moment. But I was just like, you know what, Steve? You came into the world with a bang and you're going out with the bang, buddy, man. We did it. Wow. You know? And it was it was it was it was crazy cool. And and, and, and yeah. I'm not mad. I, I mean, and it was it's just it. But th that's my life. I, I don't think you've ever refused a picture before. No, and I thought this was going to be the first no, time. I was like, I was like, Sh sure, you know. But I was well, like, if you're bold enough to yeah, ask, I was like, let's do wow. this. But it was, and and so, and I'm driving home, and I'm thinking to myself, and this goes back to being tested on sobriety. I was the guy that had to get drunk to pay his bills. I was the guy that needed six beers to mow the lawn. Now I'm able to go through tough moments in life and not depend or rely on substances to get me through them. Yeah. And when we talked about earlier, you said, what was tough about it? There are certain situations in life where I just want to escape. I just want to run. I just want to hide. Mm-hmm. But I, I can't do that. I can face tough decisions now. I can make tough decisions now. And I know I'll be all right. Because the last five years that I've gone through, I've proved that time and time again. So I know in recovery, when you say you've got this, that's when you don't. So I don't have this. But I'm equipped for this fight like I've never been equipped before. So whatever the world has to bring at me, bring it. Because I'm going to give you everything I got. And I'll give you the standard answer that I give everybody when I'm talking about my sobriety. I do not know if I'm going to win this fight. But they're going to know they got in a fight. Because I'm not going down easy. And I'm going to give it everything I got. I like it. So this one's for you, Steve. Wow. I love you, buddy. And thanks for being with me the whole time. You were a great dog. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. It was, I mean... It was tough. I mean, uh, well, you know what? It was a special moment because you were sober. You were able to experience that roller coaster of emotion and have it mean something to you. If you'd been drunk, it wouldn't have been special. It would have been a nightmare. And I don't know if I would have reacted the same to the situation that was in front of me. Right. You know, and uh, I know in my disease and in my addiction, I used alcohol to run, hide, numb and avoid all tough aspects of my life mm -hmm. when everything anything got the slightest amount hard is when i would go i need a beer mm -hmm. you know and people would be like we gotta talk about this. let's get a beer and talk about it yeah that, that was that was my coping mechanism yeah. oh and i think so many people have grown up since their adolescence using drugs and alcohol as the coping mechanism for hard times they haven't learned how to face hard times without it. And so, of course, that becomes the go-to. So uh, thank you for allowing me to, to, to talk, allowing to do this every week. It really means the world to me. And people ask me what, you know, 
this is my foot into the recovery world. This is how I stay grounded. This is how I stay connected. And if it wasn't for this weekly podcast and our chats with you, Dr. Matt and Josh, I mean, you guys are family to me and you are my support group. And I was, I was talking to somebody the other day and they go, you know, what's your biggest uh, allies? And I go, it's Dr. Matt, it's Josh, it's this podcast, it's my girlfriend, it's my kids. I'm very fortunate to have so many people backing me up. And sometimes I have survivor's guilt because I know there's people out there that do not have the support system that I do. And I'm very blessed and very grateful and very fortunate. And so hopefully for some of those out there who are suffering, let us be your allies. Let us be your support. Let us share your story so you can help others. Because when we're helping others, it's 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 crazy, but we're really helping ourselves. We are. Uh, service always pays off more for you than the people you serve, I think. But that's the beautiful part of it is we can all give service and receive a lot in return. And I hope that one small aspect of this show is that the people who don't have the natural support systems in place in their life are listening to the stories and finding resources and options in our community where they can go out and create a new family, a sober family. I, I know that, uh, you know, with some of the, the groups that are a little non-traditional, the exercise-based recovery groups. The SOAR, and, the Fit to Recover. Yeah, these are places where people have found a family that supports them as well. So if we could be a small part of helping people find that connection, it's it's worth it. And for me, by the time Thursday rolls around, uh, I'm ready for it. I, I can't wait to come in. You know, by the time Thursday rolls around, it's often been a long week for me. Yeah. And I can't wait to come in and um, and be with you guys. We got a front row seat to some of the most inspiring stories Absolutely. that uh, the world has to offer. And some of the best stories come from the world of addiction mm-hmm. and the overcoming, uh, you know, just it, it's amazing what, what, what somebody in recovery can do and is doing. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to talk to our guest here in just a second, but I noticed you got uh, Matt's oh. Mental Health Minute. <laughs> it seems a little seems a little trite after uh after Well, we can Steve save it. Story. Whatever you want to no, do. No, let's, let's do it real let's quick. Let's jump into it. Just because maybe it'll be, a, it's lighthearted. Ooh, I love it. Well, yeah. Yeah. as lighthearted as cancer can be. Oh. But um, <laughs> new study out in the mm-hmm. Journal of American Medical Association. So that's the real deal. They call it the JAMA. Okay. Yeah. In the JAMA, a new study came out this month, and this is what it says. Drinking sugar-laden beverages, does that sound like the state of Utah? Anyway, on a regular basis may increase the risk for liver cancer and death from chronic liver disease. Really? And, hang on, you know, we've got all those, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think of, I say it on the show a lot, but but the high-calorie foods, the high-sugary foods, the, the fast food, the drive through soda places, the soda cocktail places, um, they're everywhere in the state of Utah. I think because our cultures, many people of our culture try to avoid drugs and alcohol yeah. for religious purposes, which is great. But sometimes they don't realize they're developing other addictions. And I know people that roll through there quite often. And this is for the older ladies who go through the drive through a lot, postmenopausal women who consume at least one sugar-sweetened beverage daily had an 85% higher risk of developing liver cancer Wow! and a 68% higher risk of dying from chronic liver disease. Guess who else dies from chronic liver disease? Alcoholics. Mm-hmm. So if you're, if you're rolling through and getting your Dr. Peppers and all those different kinds of soda-y, soda-y drinks, you might want to rethink that do you have an addiction do you think it can be an addiction oh i think it's 100 percent addiction i do there are longer lines at those soda soda shops than there are at our liquor stores yeah and you know the i was talking to i was at my son's basket or football practice the other night and i was talking to a lady and she talks about how she goes through it multiple times a day yeah and i go that's an oh, addiction and she goes is it and i go yeah, yeah. it's 100 percent addiction caffeine and sugar yeah I go, stimulants do you, do you feel bad if you can't get it do you make it a priority yeah do you get the headaches yeah yeah the caffeine withdrawal i, go, I hate to so tell what's you what's the addiction what's the definition of an addiction something that overtakes your life yep it overtakes your life you become dependent on it and when you don't have it you have symptoms of withdrawal mm. and you tell me so anybody in listening to the show who goes through the the soda drive throughs every day Try to go three days without going through. And you tell me if you don't get the shakes and the headaches and all that kind of stuff. So it's just, you know, addiction comes in lots of different forms. Um, And I I think sometimes we don't realize how dangerous something like 
uh, these sugary drinks can be if you're consuming them every day. All right, I'm going to throw you a curveball before we get to our guest, Matt. Um, is there such thing as a healthy addiction? I don't, addiction, not by that definition, no. No. There are healthy habits. Yeah. Absolutely. But if it becomes an addiction. If you become dependent on something and when you don't have it, you have a withdrawal, I mean, maybe somebody could change my mind, but that doesn't sound like it's healthy in any way. Yeah. Even something that might in smaller doses be good. Well, I know people that are addicted to the gym. And oh, absolutely. It, and, and, and that's causing them problems at work, causing problems in marriage. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they're they're, they are over exercising. Their joints are wearing out faster. And absolutely, you know, anything that you're dependent on, and when you don't have it, you feel withdrawal symptoms. That that can be an addiction. Absolutely. All right. Our guest today, I've known him for what? Probably four or five years. Yeah, about four years. Right when I got out of rehab and I was working for Pinnacle Recovery, you're working for another recovery center. We were doing the similar jobs, and we go to breakfast once a month and kind of network and see how we could help each other out. Right. His name is Matt Borget or Bourget. And what was the other one? Uh, Borget. Borget. But what do you prefer? Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> there you go, buddy. Uh, how long have you been sober? Uh, coming up on nine years. So I got eight years. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Congratulations. We're going to find out more about Matt's story. You're listening to Project Recovery right here on KSL. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist. Our guest today celebrating eight I'm also an emotional wreck after the I know. Steve story. I'm Holy sorry, cow. man. No, I'm glad you shared that. Yeah, I, it was, I, I think that's a special story. And, and uh, I think the whole thing, how it all turned out, is the most Casey story I've ever heard yeah. in my whole life. It's crazy. Yeah. But that's my life, and I love it, and I welcome it, and I'm so glad that I get And I want people to know, you and I both know some media professionals that embellish stories. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's- But, but not you. No. Casey does not. If Casey tells a story, it's the real deal. That yeah, was, it right. happened. Anyway. Uh, speaking of the real deal, his name is Matt Bourget, and uh, he's got eight years in recovery coming up on nine years. Uh, what was your DOC, as they say in the hood? What was your drug of choice? Uh, more. It was my drug of choice. <laughs> you, you, um, whatever it was, you just wanted more. And you know what? He says that jokingly. No, but, that's, but that's, that's. I'm sure true. Very accurate. Yeah. I mean, and then what they call it poly. Poly substance use. And so usually there's one that will bring you down because it's easier to get or it, it really aligns with your lifestyle. But before we get into all of that, where does the story of Matt begin? Uh Happy Valley, Utah. I uh, was raised in Utah County, lived in a few places, but mainly Orem. For those that don't know who listen outside of the state, Happy Valley is uh, the home of UVU, BYU. Do you know why it got the nickname Happy Valley? My my understanding of it is, you know, big religious pre presence there and... Uh, the kind of the culture there is everything is great, everything's fine. We don't talk about the hard things. We kind of look the other way, and so it's this culture of everything's perfect when we know that that's not the case. You know, in fact, around the early two thousands, there was a uh, documentary on substance abuse called Happy Valley about uh, prescription drug abuse in Utah County, which is the county south of of Salt Lake City. If any. Buddy who's listening from out of the state has been here before, and uh, they nicknamed it Happy Valley for that very reason because we don't do we don't do the hard things, we don't go to the liquor store, we don't buy drugs in the park, but the prescription drug abuse was really high. Right. Yeah, and I think you know one thing that I learned being raised there is for every culture there's a counterculture. Yep. Right. And I I fell pretty deep into that counterculture. So where does the story of uh, young Matt begin? You grew up in Happy Valley. What would what did your family look like? Yeah, so I had uh, two siblings. I was the youngest, older brother, older sister. Uh parents that stayed together. I had a really good childhood. Um looking back on it, um did a lot of great things as a kid. No no major trauma. I know a lot of people that struggle with addiction. There's there's trauma in childhood. Um, but you know, big LDS family, my dad has a bunch of siblings. They all have a bunch of kids and I'm kind of on the older end of all those cousins. So I grew up with so many cousins, a family that got together often, uh, even to the point where I, I had a hard time remembering some of my cousins names, you know, <laughs> um, it's kind of a Utah thing. And, uh, 
you know, I think I think where things started with me in this journey is is the pressures that I felt uh, being raised in Utah County, not only from my family, my extended family, but but also my community and and my peers at school. So you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because I don't think we've talked about that much about the external pressure from your community in the predominant religion uh, therein. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, you know, it was neighborhoods, it was wards, it was churches, and they all wanted to be the best, most mm-hmm. perfect one they could be. And so it it, it was really kind of a. A community feel, right? Oh, absolutely. I don't know if you felt this way, Matt, but a lot of people have told me you sort of grew up feeling like you you were being watched. Yeah, like yeah, like for sure. everybody knew everybody. So for people that aren't LDS, your congregation's called your ward, and it's a geographical boundary. And so so you know, in your neighborhood, it's not just people that live on your street, but you might go to church with most of them and go to church youth activities with Boy a lot Scouts, of them. your soccer Boy, team, yep, all that. So all there's it, all this yeah, overlap. Yeah. So you a lot of kids felt like you know, there were always eyes on them. Yeah. And I I think one thing that's tough looking back with hindsight on my childhood, you know, at the time I probably would have said, Oh, I'm rebellious and I'm, you know, breaking rules and thought of myself as a bad kid. But looking back, I was, I was a good kid. Um, I just don't know if I, I fit that mold perfectly. Well, I think, I think you bring up a great point from a developmental psychologist point of view. And that is that there is normal rebelliousness that's part of our normal development as we're growing up so you know the end of elementary beginning in junior high you kind of want to spend less time with the family push back you try out kind of the idea of being a cool kid or a bad boy <laughs> and in in hindsight we we look back and we're like oh i was just a silly kid but at the time you feel kind of like oh i'm really pushing the boundaries because you know i rode my bike downtown at 10 o'clock or yeah. you know whatever it is you we know doorbell ditch doorbell <laughs> ditch toilet paper you know and um but in a community that frowns upon any negative behavior, it can be treated like it's true rebellion, like it's really something bad. And there were times when my dad would get a phone call from somebody because I grew up in a small town. Where it was like, did you know Matt and his friends were out late, you know, riding their bikes and they were probably up to no good. And, you know, of course we were, but it was that kind of mischievous stuff, not really bad. Right, right. So, you know, I, I think to put a bow on it, Growing up, I kind of felt out of place, Mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, the friends that I had growing up, we were a little rebellious. We were punk rockers. We kind of grew up in, uh, the tail end of the, uh, you know, hardcore straight edge scene. There was, there was quite a scene of that in Provo. And so, did you uh, take the markers and were drawing oh, X yeah. on your hand? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the music was a big part of that. You know, as a kid, I really liked music, playing in bands, skateboarding, snowboarding, um, but all my friends, they didn't, they didn't do drugs. You know, this music we were listening to was very against it. And well, that was know, a straight edge. Scene. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for, for those sure. who don't know, straight edge was a movement and it probably still is where it's anti drugs. It's anti alcohol. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's the minor threat, the Fugazi. Minor threat, Fugazi. Yeah. Yes, Ian yes. McKay. Oh, yes. look at yeah. Dr. Oh, Matt. You, you know it. Oh, I love gosh. this. Some of us might Hold have on, listened I to pick that up those names also. you're dropping, bud. Yes. Oh, yeah, wow. Know, whatever. So, you know, there was a couple times in, in, uh, in junior high that uh, I I smoked pot and I drank alcohol, but it was secret from my friends. It was outside of my friend group. And I, I remember like, I'm not going to do that again because my friends would kill me if they knew. So I, I kind of got introduced and was like, eh, not for me. Um, but then, then by my junior year, um, you know, I had dated the same girl throughout high school and we broke up and, uh, I, I was hanging with some older kids and I'm like, and they were smoking pot. So I'm like, I'm going to give it a try. And my experience was a lot different. You know, I enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, it was a problem at that point. It was very innocent, was having fun with friends. But I started to, and I'm sure you hear this all the time. I started to experience community from that, you know, and I think, I guess you can say that's where things started because it's like, I didn't fit into this community that I grew up with, but now I'm fitting in with my with my peers. Um, you know, did you always have a curiosity about it? Because what you're telling me is, as a as a younger kid, uh, your family didn't use drugs or alcohol. They weren't into that, and even your your straight edge friends, they weren't into it. They were actually against it. So, but you went and found it. So Correct. Was there kind of a natural yeah interest I mean, for sure? I mean, with my love for music, I'd look at people like Kurt Cobain and Janis Joplin and 
you know, uh, any one of the stones, uh, any one of the stones, died early, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I kind of saw these tortured souls that played this amazing music and had these great lifestyles and were addicted to drugs. And there was kind of an appeal there, you know, yeah. or a curiosity, as you said, like totally. Um, I was pretty cautious going into it. Um, I did. I did tell my parents that I drank the one time. Uh, it was at a show my band was playing that was right across from a liquor store. Mm. An older guy bought a bottle, and um, but I really wasn't interested at, in that time. Um, and so you find a community of some people after a heartbreak smoking some weed. Yeah. And you, do you feel like you're more attracted to the marijuana or the community surrounding it? I'm glad you asked that. Probably the community, honestly. Um, and I was pretty cautious with other stuff, you know, one thing that I think is really important to let people know and what I wish I would have known early on is I was doing innocent things at the start. I was smoking a little pot, taking mushrooms with my friends or taking a little LSD. And I would do that and go, Hey, you know, nothing bad happened. You know, I didn't try and fly off the roof of my house. I didn't, you know, wreck I think my car. I think it's interesting you say that because when parents talk to their kids and they tell them about drugs and alcohol, they paint a picture such that if you do this, you're instantaneously going to be addicted and your life's going to fall apart and all this other stuff. Reefer so, madness. Yes. yes. Reefer madness. And so when you do it the first time and you go, wait a minute, that wasn't bad. It was actually fun. And... I didn't hurt anybody. And so what's so wrong with this? Right. And that that kind of segued into experimenting with more drugs, having kind of the same experience and ha being extremely naive when I got introduced to hard drugs, because I'm like, you know, I well, just to be just to be clear, uh, acid is a hard drug. OK, yeah. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> yeah, true. You know, what I mean, on the hierarchy of drugs, I think acid is pretty high up there. Yeah, but I, I think I mean more from like a, a addiction potential or dependence depend, uh, potential. It's, yeah. it's, you know, I never took LSD and woke up the next morning and go, I want to do that again right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know that would happen when somebody introduced me to opiates or cocaine or, right. you know, anything harder than that. So um, for, for years, you know, in high school, I started with that out of high school, really, really got fond of selling marijuana um, and that lifestyle and easy, felt like I was pretty easy, good quick at it. money, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, by the time I got out of high school, it was all about psychedelics. I wanted to try every psychedelic I could. Um, and, you know, doing research, chemicals, you name it. I was fascinated by it. And my life was OK at that point. I mean, if you asked me, um, I was I was selling marijuana, making good money doing it, living in a nice house, had tons of uh, friends. Uh, I was going to ask, <laughs> you know, what happened? You said your junior year, you sort of started off into this group of other friends that yeah. used. What happened to your relationships with the straight edge friends? Uh, those dwindled. You know, and and so did my hobbies. Honestly, I mentioned I liked you know skateboarding and snowboarding and playing in bands. That all went out the window um, because I think what I got from those things um, I was now getting from from drugs or my friends. It that, became that more feeling, of a priority. Yeah. 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 Um, and so after after high school, doing all of this, I you know my life was perfect. If you would have asked me, I've got money, I've got drugs, I've got friends, uh, and then. Uh, I believe it was in 2009, I had Utah major crimes uh, kick in my door. I woke up that morning, had a bowl of cereal, watching some SpongeBob and, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's a good day so far. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, uh, you know, a bunch of people in SWAT gear and rifles uh, come into my house. And what wow. I what I had found out is uh, one of the people that I was selling to had gotten into some trouble, had become a confidential informant. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I had sold marijuana to uh, the government a few times. They don't like that. No. And so, um, and, and I guess it's important to say around that time, uh, I was, I had so much money. I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I was 19 making really good money. What is and, it? What is really good money? You know, oh, well, for a 19 year old, I should say, I mean, uh, you know, I, it, I'd i say I'd probably be making $10,000 a month at least. Wow. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm 49. And it's really good. <laughs> yeah. um, and I remember talking to, you know, the guy that was selling me marijuana, like, I don't know what to do with this money. And he said, come over tomorrow. I'll show, I want to show you something. So I go over to his house Did the you next buy a day. tiger? Oh, I wish I would have. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
be a lot more interesting if that's how this story went. Uh, I go over to his house the next day, and he's got these little blue pills that say 80 on one side and OC oh, yeah. on the other. And, uh, you know, he breathes on them, wipes off the stuff, throws it down on some tin foil, and he shows me how to smoke Oxycontin. Um, at that point in my life, I had tried uh, pain pills. I enjoyed them, um, but it wasn't something that I was actively seeking when they'd come around. Great. Um, had you always just swallowed them pre- previously? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Maybe snorted them a few times, but mm-hmm. um, and I, I honestly think in that moment, you know, my my life changed forever. That was the moment I believe I became an addict. That was mm-hmm. the moment that I said to myself. I need to chase this feeling for the rest of my life. Um, and from that day, um, that's all I, sp- I found out where to spend that money. You know, how easy was it to make that leap into this guy going, Hey, let me show you about smoking this. Did, did you have any red flags, any reservations? Did you be like, Hey, maybe I shouldn't. No, it was kind of like everything else. It was like, Oh, I tried this drug and it wasn't so bad. Well, it sounds like you were a really curious minded person who, who was just wanting to experiment with, whatever i mean you were in bands you were skateboarding you were snowboarding and th- and then you said like with the drugs you were researching yes like a lot of people don't think to do the research i think that's an interesting part of your personality structure is that you you wanted to know hows and whys and ins and outs and all that stuff i found out <laughs> <laughs> So you said after you smoked it the first time, you knew what your new mission in life was? 100%. Um, and I d- had no idea what I was getting into. I did not know, um, you know, if I do this every day and I stop, I'm going to get sick. Um, and the first time that I stopped was when I got raided by Utah Major Crimes and was, mm. went to Utah County Jail. Mm. Um, it was the first time I completely detoxed. I wasn't there for very long. Um, but when I got out, I went back to my parents' house. These friends that I had all disappeared. That's uh, weird. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I think they liked the drugs I was selling more than they liked me. And they liked my house where we could party more than they liked me. And so it was, it was a pretty big wake-up call for me. Um, so when you go move in back with your parents, uh-huh. do they sit you down? And, I mean, what are they thinking? Uh I, I mean, with hindsight, I just, I, my poor parents, I don't think they had any idea how to handle things like this. I don't think this is something that they saw growing up. They certainly didn't have to deal with this with my other siblings. So this was like uncharted waters for them. Um, you know, naturally they were upset, they were heartbroken, um, and they expressed that to me, but I don't think that they knew how to handle it. But as an addict, I know speaking from experience, you've probably downplayed it or a hundred percent sold them a bill of goods. That wasn't nothing. Yeah. What was really going on? Just, just a little pot. They had no idea about the opiates or anything like that. I, uh, I remember, uh, being very, very sick and helping my uncle move his house and, and doing that and withdrawal is not fun, but I had to pull it together Mm -hmm. and act like everything was okay. Um, you know, and, and after that, I, st- I stayed clean for a little bit off the opiates. I thought, that's my issue. That was not good. And I went back to smoking pot and doing other things and, uh, you know, entered into an IOP program. It was my first treatment. I faked my drug test, got off probation, got very fortunate uh, with everything with court, didn't get in too much trouble. I, I went in on felony distribution charges um, and ended up just serving probation. Um, but by the time I was done with probation, it was, it was full tilt. Um, and then I became a lot more interested in pharmaceuticals, benzodiazepines, cocaine. Um, and, and it was, it was just that lifestyle of, of hanging with people that are selling drugs, using drugs, trying new things. What can we get? Um, and, uh, I, I, and one of the funny things that I say is like, I realized I had a, a problem with opiates when I'm like, I haven't smoked pot in like two months and that's my favorite thing in the world. (laughs) You know, (laughs) that was my first realization that I may have had a problem with opiates, but after getting off probation, uh, it's just, everyone was doing it in Utah County. It was so easy to get. I've, I've, I've heard a lot of people come on this podcast and talk about how expensive Oxycontin was. I mean, when, when I was doing it, it, we could get it fairly cheap. There it was just everywhere in Utah County. Um, but, uh, so the, the drug use progressed, you know, I was no longer experimenting with other things and was pretty much strictly using benzodiazepines and heroin, which is not a good combination. No, that's a downer and a downer. Yeah. So how do you go from... Well, let me let me ask a quick question. Yeah. Is that okay if I jump yeah, no, in on sure, you yeah. real quick? Um, so I, I have sort of kind of a side thing that is a curiosity of mine. 
So developmentally, you know, with something that's related to drug addiction is the selling and the making of the money, right? Right. And so when you're a young kid, you're just out of high school, you're 18, 19, usually back in those days, you're making, you know, six, seven bucks an hour, trying to scrape together enough money for a car payment. Um, And you learn, I think, to work hard and some kids learn how to save their money and do that sort of thing. But what's it like to your, what does it do to your brain uh, when you jump out of high school and you've got a house and you're making 10 grand a month and you don't even have a job. Like you're working a few minutes a week probably selling this stuff, right? Right. And you're not you're not having to go clock in and deal with a boss and, you know, folding jeans at whatever <laughs> place in the mall. Like you're not having to do all that like hard work stuff. How, is it is it seem just crazy to get out of jail and out of rehab and be like, okay, now I'm going to go get a $7 an hour job. Like it seems like that would be almost as strong as the actual addiction to pull right. a 19, 20 year old back into that lifestyle. I chased it for a long time. You know, after getting arrested, it was just like, I just need to get back to that moment. And my mind frame when that was going on, I'm, I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof and I'm smarter than everybody. Cause you guys are suckers. You know, my girlfriend at the time would, come home from work and I'd be like, I made $900 today. And it took me, and just like you said, it took me five minutes. I had three people come over and we hung out and we watched SpongeBob together, you know? (laughs) It's a lot better working at the gap. Yeah, for sure. So now you're chasing it. Uh, You're saying it's pretty prevalent down there in Utah County and pretty cheap. Yes. My question is, is if it was so cheap, why did you make the jump from that to heroin? Because when we've had people on the podcast, you know, normally it's because of the cost and the access to it, but it sounds like the cost and access was there for you. For sure. Um, Well, you know, I got to the point where I was no longer making that money anymore. Right. And I was having to work normal jobs. And so the money wasn't really there for me anymore. And then once uh, Oxycontin changed its formula, it's no longer, you know, it's tamper proof. You can't smoke it anymore. Uh, people didn't really want it. And I switched at that point from using Oxycontin to using uh, Oxymorphone. And uh, what I've since learned is that that's stronger than heroin and has a much shorter half-life. So while I was using that, I mean, I would get violently ill if I didn't have it every four hours. And that was expensive. And uh, there was one time my dealer didn't have it. And he says, hey, I've got some black. And uh, I remember the first time I tried heroin, I just remember thinking, this is exactly what I've been doing for the last two years. Um, and with heroin, I wasn't getting sick every four hours. I could I could go 12 hours. And I'm like, this is the solution to all my problems Isn't right here. Isn't that crazy that's coming out of your mouth that heroin is the solution? Yeah. Well, that's the mindset, right? I mean, at the time, you're like, okay, I, f- I found something that fix. I'm not getting dope sick. And it's a tenth of the price. Yeah. So, you know, that goes on for a while and, and everybody that I'm using with are dropping like flies. I've got friends dying every month, sometimes multiple a month from, you know, substance use, suicide. Um, there was only a few people that I was using benzos and heroin with. Most of my friends were only using heroin. Um, and I had three friends that I was doing that with and they all didn't make it a year of doing that. They had all overdosed. And I was, you know, and I had some survivor's guilt, you know, going through treatment and looking back on that. Um, but in uh, 2013, um, the girl that I was dating at the time and my dad intervened on me. Um, you know, I didn't know this at the time, but when you do a downer and a downer, like you're saying, I was I was on the nod constantly. I was slumped over, dozing out. And um, family tends to notice that when you're hanging around them. And uh, if you tell them you're just tired, uh, it's hard for them to believe that you're, you know, you've been tired for a year. What's going on? Um, so they intervened uh, with the fear that every family or loved one has when they intervene. Of, he might run out the door and go die face down in a ditch. And they said, hey, we want you to go to treatment. And I said, I'm not doing that. And I left and I went to my drug dealer's house and I said, man, I'm giving you all this money for all this heroin, I'm supporting your habit. I need you to put me up for a few days while I figure things out. And so you he, moved in with the drug dealer? No. He, he looked at me and said, I do not trust you to stay in my house. You are a mess. Uh, I don't want you to die like all our friends that are dying. You should take this opportunity and go to treatment. And I said, forget you. So the drug, hold on. Okay. <laughs> the drug dealer looks at you and says, 
you're a mess. I don't want you in my house. And that was not a wake up call. No. <laughs> he says you should take your family's <laughs> offer and go to rehab. No. So I go over to a using friend's house, somebody that I would use with regularly. And I go to him and I say, hey, I need you to put me up for a few days. My family's trying to ship me off to treatment. And he says the same exact thing. You're not staying in my house. I don't trust you. Wow. Um, How bad were you that a drug dealer and a using friend wouldn't let you stay in their house? Pretty bad. I think, you know, after two, that was like, okay, I'm going back home. I'm going to give treatment a try. Um, and so I entered treatment my first time in, in July of 2013. And uh, I was not a good client. You know, working in the field now and, and, and seeing uh, people come in, I'm like, I'm glad I didn't have me as a client the first couple of times I went. But, you know, it's because I've worked in the field and you work in the field. Uh, you didn't go for the right reasons. Not at all. You went because it was your only option. You had just been told by a using friend and a drug dealer that you were too much of a mess to stay in their house. Yeah. So, they, I mean, they, they, this was just your only option. Yes. So one thing that I sometimes forget and leave out of my story is that I'd gotten engaged probably two months before this to a girl that I had started dating right when I started using opiates and was selling drugs. And so my attitude in that relationship that I was entirely checked out for uh, was that she knew she knew what she was getting into. Mm -hmm. I was selling drugs. I was using drugs when we started dating. Um and my <laughs> wedding date was set for my discharge date from my first treatment center. And looking back on that, it's just bananas. Um, did you, know, you get married on that day? I did. They let me graduate treatment two days early so I could go get married. Um, had the same attitude as before of like, you know, hey, opiates are my problem. Benzos are my problem, but I'm going to do everything else. So, I mean, on my uh, honeymoon, I was smoking pot and taking pills and, you know, this poor woman, you know, just putting me through treatment and seeing this go on right when I get out. And to be honest with you, I had found a way to get benzos into treatment. I had stopped using them before getting out. So I'd been off of them, but you know, I went right back to it. Um, and you're right. I was, it wasn't my choice to go there. I wasn't there for the right reasons. And, uh, you know, I, I did okay for a few months with trying to, uh, not use opiates or my drug of choice. Or okay. So, cause I've done this and I think as addicts, we often do this. We downplay it and yeah. we go, I did okay, but we didn't, did we? I mean, comparatively to how I was doing before, but definitely not okay. For somebody who's not an addict looking at you. Okay. is not okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, for sure. Uh, it, it, yeah. I was definitely telling myself that though. Yeah. Um, I, uh, got a job working downtown Salt Lake, which is not a good spot for an opiate addict. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, to make a long story really short, uh, I was you know two blocks away from where I needed to get drugs. And I'd been through treatment and learned about crack cocaine. And I'm like, I'm doing a downer and a downer and I'm really sleepy all the time. So I started using crack cocaine and I'm like, this is the answer to all my problems. <laughs> I thought I'm, heroin was the answer to your problems. It, it became problematic. And so I had to get a new solution. <laughs> a new solution. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so and crack cocaine was it. Yes. Because then it would wake me up a little bit. Right. <laughs> Makes a sense. Um, Just a little. But to make a long story short, I was the, the business I was working for, I ended up embezzling money from. And, uh, when they got, when they got hip to that, fortunately I'd gotten my tax return that day and it was like the exact amount that I had taken. And I got honest with them. They had kn known my past, known I was uh, in treatment previously. And I just said, Hey, I got to go back to treatment. I took some money from you. I will bring it to you tomorrow and the keys and I'm checking back into treatment. And thank God they were okay with that and wanted me to get help because really? I could have gotten were... in big trouble. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I go back to treatment again, being forced to, um, and not, not on my own accord, no other options, didn't take it serious. Uh, I ended up uh, using in treatment again. Again, not a good client. Um, was just very sick at that time um, and got kicked out. And this is the most pivotal part of my story. I'd gotten kicked out of treatment um, and... Uh, that one of those, one of my using buddies let me stay at his house cause I was sober and, um, I had, I had reached out to my parents and my, I had a very, uh, crucial conversation with my parents and I don't remember if it was my mom or my dad, but I remember them finally having boundaries and, and they had started to learn how to deal with this through my treatment stays and through doing therapy and doing their own work. And they said something along the lines of, if you want to be a junkie, you're welcome to do that. You go figure it out. You go figure out how to be a successful junkie 
we don't want any part of it. We're not going to give you money. You can't stay at our house. We don't want to have a relationship with you, but you are welcome to go figure that out. And the flip side was, if you want to stay sober and work towards a life in sobriety, there's nothing we won't do to support you. And this, How hard do you think that was for your parents to set that boundary? Uh, I'm glad you asked. I talked to my mom last night and was kind of talking about these things with her. Um, and she said it's one of the hardest things she's ever had to do. Okay. Um, and it was terrifying, you know, because um, you, you essentially got two options. Something bad's going to happen um, or they might get the help that they need. But if you do nothing, something bad's going to happen. You know, I don't know. I don't know the statistic, but I've heard the majority of of people that that die from substance use, it's at home with their enabler. Mm-hmm. You know, you think about that. How profound that statement is. Yeah. If you do nothing, something bad is going to happen for sure. And you know how many people's uh, recovery plan is do nothing. You know, because they don't have a plan. You know what I mean? And right. they don't know where to go and they don't know what to do. So they just keep doing what they're going to do. It, And eventually you're right. Something bad is going to happen. So things shifted for me there with with my parents having those boundaries. I realized I can't do this on my own without an enabler. It's not going to work. So I'm like, I, I don't have any options. Um, luckily, you know, I was young enough. I was on my parents' insurance. Um, I said, hey, if I go to a detox center and they said, go for it. And while I was in detox, like, hey, I think I need treatment. And they're like, okay. Uh, and they found a place in Network, uh, New Roads down in Provo. Um, happy and, Valley. Yeah, Happy Valley. It was, And it was a great thing for me to get sober in my stomping grounds. You know, at any point, I'm like driving past this dude's house and this place. And I had to constantly make that decision of I'm staying in treatment. I'm not getting out of here. I'm not making the same mistakes as before. Um that program was 90 days. I went and did 90 days there and, and I started to have that shift and take it serious. And Was there something in that 90 days that clicked? You know, you said you had that conversation with your mom or your dad and something clicked. Was there something in uh, the treatment that started to make sense or was there something that kept going, hey, you know what, I think I'm on the right path here. Why do I keep going? Yeah, I, I think the approach that they had in this treatment center was a therapeutic community, which means like I was accountable to my peers. Um, and that kind of shifted how I was viewing things. Um, the other thing, too, is it, I was constantly reminded, if you don't want to be here, we're, we're welcome to show you where the front door is, you know, and there's somebody out there that needs your bed. So if you don't want to take this serious, you know, and so I was constantly getting checked and reminded, you know, I need to stay here. I need to be here. It it shifted my perception into something that I wanted rather than something I was being told I needed to do. You know, I think that's so important because me being an addict and other people out there that so many people think of treatment as a punishment. Right. When in all actuality, it's a reward. It's a gift. I mean, it's, it really is a gift. You know what I mean? But when you get that mindset switch where the two prior times you'd went, it was a punishment and it was your last resort. This third time, It's a gift. Right. Somebody's given you a chance to leave that behind and start a new life and figure out how to navigate these waters without the use of substance. Right. So I ended up doing 120 days there at this 90 day program. I was I was pretty scared to leave. Um, And a lot of the staff that worked there were 12 step people. I got curious about it, started asking questions. The treatment center took us to meetings and seeing people pick up these chips. I'm like, just scratching my head going, how do they do this? This is crazy. So uh, I started to get very curious about it. Um, And I got out of treatment and started doing the things that I was taught in treatment and taught in 12-step programs. Um, And I learned a very valuable lesson because I started making excuses on why I didn't need to keep doing those things. Um, And it honestly was like I blinked my eyes and woke up one morning and it's I'm using drugs again. So you had a relapse. Um, I had a relapse. Uh, I almost made it to six months and I had a relapse. And, um, you know, that relapse, I was going to a, a, an Alcoholics Anonymous convention in Salt Lake. And uh, I, I went for the first day. I go back the second day and I'm driving and I'm like, I should go drive by the block downtown because you know, I don't go there anymore, which means nobody probably goes there anymore. I just got to see if that's still even a thing, right? And uh, <laughs> it's a thing. It, I found out it's still a thing. It, yeah. it was still a thing at that point, you know. And I think once I hit that turn signal to go check out down there is when I when I relapsed. But well, it's interesting. Something as simple as 
hitting the turn signal, knowing where you're going, that conditioning that happens, you know, that becomes enmeshed with that, um, that addiction wiring in your brain. And so it can be something as simple as, you know, driving by and seeing a certain house or making the decision to hit the turn signal and it can start firing those addiction, you know, pathways that have been so ingrained from, you know, years of use that something as small as a turn signal can start the whole process going again. I had someone once tell me that uh, before a beer hits my lips, I relapsed multiple days before. In mm-hmm. my mind, mm-hmm. in my brain, yeah. I played it out. You know what I mean? Right. It wasn't the act of the, the beer actually hit. I had relapsed way prior to that. Yeah, that's a, a very accurate way to think of it when you realize how your brain functions and tries to get those pathways going again. Yeah. So you, so you relapse and you wake up. How, how, how long did the relapse last for? Shortest one I've ever had. Um, and one thing that was very different, this was, this was my last uh, debacle, right? This was my last time using... Uh, right before I got sober. But what I did very different this time was I tried my best to control it. You know, at at any point previously, just it was completely out of control. Um, You know, there's a passage in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that says the great obsession of every abnormal drinker is to one day enjoy and control his drinking. And at this, you know, up until this point, it had been out of control. And now I'm trying to control it. And what I found is when I'm trying to control it, I don't enjoy it. Um, You know, I was... I'm only going to use this much heroin a day, this much Xanax, uh, get this much to drink at night, and I can use cocaine on the weekends. And I did that for about a month, and uh, it broke me spiritually and emotionally because I wasn't getting what I wanted from the drugs and the alcohol. I wasn't sober. I wasn't getting anything that I wanted from life. It was it was a very, very dark time for me. Kind of a no man's land. Yes, and yeah. uh, I couldn't stay sober. I couldn't, you know... Uh, figure anything out. It was like, I didn't know which way was up. And on December 1st, 2014, I called my mom just to tell her how sad I was and how I wasn't doing well. Um, and my mom simply just asked me, how are you doing in your sobriety? And I said, not good and started ugly crying and couldn't get a word out. Um, and it was at that, and that's my sobriety date. Um, I started making phone calls. I had just done four months in treatment. So I start making phone calls to people saying, Hey, I just need a little refresher. You know, I don't need to come back for 90 days, you know, just relapsing for a month and trying to make things work my way. Um, and I spoke to a woman named Nicole who works at new roads. Um, and I'll never forget what she said to me. Cause I'm trying to spin all this stuff on her. And she said, just shut up do the next right thing, get in the car and come down here. We got you. And that was simple enough for me to be like, okay, yeah, (laughs) I can do that. Um, And I went back, I went to treatment um, for my last time, my fourth time. I'd already done seven months in treatment previous to that. Um, You know, and after about a week, once I got my feet under me, she's like, you know, you're staying for 90 days, right? And I'm like, I I know. (laughs) Um, And, uh, you know, I, I, I went back to treatment my last time with my tail between my legs because I'd convinced myself I was doing such a good job uh, previously. So uh, it just so diligent. Like, you know, if they said stand on your head in the corner for every group and you'll stay sober, I would have done it. Um, and I had a moment with my dad where he drove me to treatment that last time. Um, and I, I was terrified. I thought he was going to be so upset with me. And I remember him saying, like, I'm so proud of you. You know, because it was the first time that I made that call and said, I need to go back to treatment. Um, and that kind of shifted my my attitude about things as well. Like, I got some people in my corner that are proud of me for doing this. And, um, you know, I got out of treatment. I did another 90 days. I dove headfirst into 12-step programs. Um, and, and that saved my life. And uh, one thing that's really important, too, with my story is right before getting out of treatment. Um, Did you get married again? So I was still married at this point. And, you know, I I think I had been married for 18 months and spent nine months of that in treatment. Mm. Um, So and, you know, and that entire relationship using hard drugs. So um, and and being completely checked out, like I said. So I have a hard time even recalling what what that relationship was like. And, um, you know, I've had to make amends. And, you know, I was I was married to drugs. I was married to selling drugs and the hustle and the money. That was my marriage at that time. You know, I was I was in no shape to be in a relationship. Um, but 
getting out of getting out of treatment my last time uh, about a week before I graduated. Uh, the clinical director, program director pulled me in and said, hey, we got to share some news with you. And uh, one of my oldest friends that I had grown up with was like a brother to me, spent all my time at his house. Um, they broke the news to me that he did a murder suicide um, and was living at home with his grandma and his grandma's boyfriend. Um, apparently he was abusive and my friend struggled with some mental health stuff and he handled things the way, the best way that I think he could knew how to, you know, and, uh, it was a horrible thing. And, uh, what I found was, you know, I'd mentioned previously that I had tons of friends pass away when I was using drugs. Um, I got to deal with all the feelings in that moment that I did not deal with, uh, with my other friends. So, you know, and, and, and thank God I was in treatment and in a safe place and with people that cared about me and loved me that I could deal with that. Um, so that was super heavy right before, uh, leaving treatment my last time. And, um, when I got out of treatment, I found out pretty quick that, uh, my wife was not f being faithful to me. And, you know, at this point with hindsight, I don't blame her. Uh, I, ch I cheated on her, my entire relationship with her. Uh, but my mistress was, was heroin. Um, and so those two things happening so quickly and, you know, I'm 90 days sober, I, I had this pivotal moment where I remembered thinking like, what do I do about this? How do I not feel the way I'm feeling right now? Um, do I get high? What do I do? And I picked up the phone and I called somebody and just simply said, life's hard right now. And I don't like how I'm feeling. I remember calling my sponsor and saying, what do I do? And he said, well, go to a meeting in the morning and show up 20 minutes early and clean the place, make coffee, say hey to people when they show up after the meeting, ask, ask someone if they need a ride home, go to the next meeting after that do go to the next meeting after that, do all of that and then call me. And, uh, I do, I do all those things and I call him. He says, awesome, man. That's great. You did all that. How much time did you spend thinking about yourself? And I'm like, none. He's like, cool. Do the same thing tomorrow. You know? And, and, and after doing that for a while in a couple of weeks, I was feeling okay. And, um, you know, uh, it's the power of the program and the 12 steps and, and the community there, you know, the same community that I was looking for when I was young and falling into, drug use is is what i found in these rooms with these people and um you know i started working in the treatment industry shortly after i'm like i want to be like the people that helped me when i was in treatment and i just started as a graveyard tech and i i have tried my best to continue to do the next right thing to shut up and do the next right thing like right. nicole said <laughs> um and and uh you know, and time flies, man. Congrats on five years. Yeah, that's by the awesome. Way. I was going to say, you now eight years past. What does life look like for you now, Matt? Um, well, I uh, I have a beautiful wife. Been married. We're we're coming up on our our third wedding anniversary. Congrats. Taking a little time off. We're going to go explore some national parks. Go up to Yellowstone and Grand Teton, and um, you know, we got a couple of cats that are my ride or dies. You yeah. know, and. Uh, you know, great relationships with my family. I'm so blessed to have a great job. Uh, I love my wife's family, um, spend tons of time with them. You know, her siblings are my best friends and I'm fortunate enough that I get to work with one of them. Uh, my brother-in-law Connor works with me at Wasatch Crest and, um, life simple today, you know, it was so complex before I've just got a simple life and it's beautiful. So now you're working at Wasatch Crest and, uh, you wanted to talk uh, about a few things there and we wanted to talk about having, um, you know, sometimes in treatment, uh, it's co-ed others. It's, you know, sectioned off to where it's just men or women only. What, what does that mean to you guys up at Wasatch Crest? Yeah, I think, uh, there's some complexities that come along with doing co-ed treatment. Um, and you know, people in early, early recovery are getting their feelings back and, you know, and it's very easy to, to distract with anything. Right. And, and oftentimes people want to distract with a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and so and there's a euphoric feeling that comes along with love. I was going to say, there are a lot of things that we use to numb out, right. right? And relationships are certainly one of them and sex. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking out of school and I won't say any names, but I know the people that I was in the house with were more occupied with hooking up with somebody from the opposite sex than they were about getting serious right. and getting sober. I mean, it's a way of not sitting in your stuff and, yep. and being with, with your mess. You know, right. it's a way of distracting or numbing out. And so uh, I would say any, anything that can decrease the opportunity for major distractions while you're in treatment is probably a good idea. So at Wasatch Crest, you don't have co-ed? 
Correct. We recently just opened a new facility in Park City. We got 16 beds there, and and with that new facility opening, we decided to go gender spe- uh, gender specific for residential treatment. Mm-hmm. So we're still co-ed for outpatient treatment, mm-hmm. um, and so we have our our women in Park City, our men are in Heber. And uh, you know, to kind of speak to my experience with gender specific treatment, when I went to New Roads um, the first time, they said, "Hey, we just made the split. The guys and the girls are not together." And and the experience that I had with only being with men in treatment is there was a, a huge sense of camaraderie and brotherhood, you know, where, where some guys might be uh, jerks and trying to show out for the girls and belittle some of the other guys. There was none of that. It was a band of brothers and, and, and that's a beautiful thing in recovery. So that's mm-hmm. what we're trying to replicate at Wasatch Crest, you know, just to limit the distractions and help people, you know, be there for each other and, and break down those walls and, and, and be, vulnerable right and sometimes that can be complicated with the opposite sex there oh yeah i mean life's complicated with the opposite sex yeah for sure (laughs) you know for me anyways (laughs) um well that's awesome i am so pleased that you're doing well i'm so glad to reconnect with you i think it's awesome i listened to your story and uh you 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 look so mild mannered but to hear your story it seems like it doesn't match with his look through some stuff yeah 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 that reminds me i had a first time checking into detox i had a doctor so you're here for heroin. You don't look like a heroin addict. <laughs> so my response to him was like, well, you don't look like a doctor. So, <laughs> so and he, I've heard it before. And then he was like, oh, that. yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so if people want more information about Wasatch Crest and the, uh, you know, the, the gifts that you uh, offer up there. Yeah. Uh, they can find us online at wasatchcresttreatment.com. And then our uh, number to speak to our admissions team is 800-385-3507. Now, we've often talked about the people who listen to this podcast, and for the most part, we think it's people that are active in recovery or loved ones of people battling addiction right now. Uh, It's smart for somebody who's got a loved one that's battling addiction to call ahead of time and just find out a little bit about what you guys have to offer, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's not committal. You know, you can call for information and... Oftentimes we may not be the best fit or you may not be the best fit for us or we may not be the best fit for you. Our our goal is to help people find treatment and find recovery. And I've talked to tons of people where it's like you you may not need treatment. You know, maybe you need to go meet with a therapist, find a place that can do drug testing. And so the the options are endless and it's not just I'm calling this treatment center and they're going to put me in a vice grip and say I have to come here. I think a lot of people think that and my experience has been the opposite. It's been what you're saying that if you call for a, for a loved one, or if you call for yourself, uh, they're going to do a real assessment because they want you to be successful and they want to be successful in what they offer. And different different places have different programs and milieus. And and uh, most most people are surprised when they say, you know, they told me I wasn't a good fit for them, but they gave me these places to call. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's such that's humanity. You know, that's right. that's not about business. That's about taking care of people. I I love that. Yeah. Well, I think uh, Matt said it best when he said doing nothing is not a good option. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And, and I think I'm hoping that that some people listening use his advice on their loved ones and they just say, shut up and do the next right thing. Amen. I love that advice. Amen. Hey, uh, thank you for stopping by and listening to another episode of Project Recovery. If it wasn't for guests like Matt, who is willing to share his story, we wouldn't be able to do what we do weekly. And for that, we say thank you to Matt. Thank you to you guys listening. And Dr. Matt, thank you. Thank you, buddy. And in Thank case you, you for f- having me. You bet. And in case you forgot, Project Recovery is what? It's a KSL pot, pot, podcast. He's a good boy, Steve. <laughs> he is. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. 
KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.